Welcome to the Four Mile Circus podcast. Four Mile Circus is an independent media services company based in Brooklyn. Uh, my name is Sean Mannion. I'm a partner in Four Mile Circus and co-host of the show. And I'm Nicole Solomon. I am the other half of Four Mile Circus and the other co-host of this show. On uh, what? Well, um, that's all the co-hosts. Okay. Yeah. That's all of us. I didn't know if you're looking at me like I should introduce our guest. No, 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 no. We'll, we'll take care of that. Uh, just a quick note: if you're in New York City. Uh, join us Saturday, January 28th for our social media and crowdfunding strategies and realities workshop at 1 p.m. at Videology. You can learn more about the event at 4milecircus.com slash workshops. Um, and this is part one of our interview with the multi-talented artist Hayen Park. In this episode, we'll discuss her work and social media. But before we get into that, Nicole, do you have a tip? I do. I have a social media tip. That's awesome. Um, let's see. So considering that it's now the future when this airs, not when we're recording it, and we have time traveled into 2017, everyone followed that, right? That yeah, and if totally 2017 didn't come, then you're probably not listening to this. Fair point. Um, so, you know, the new year is a good time to get your social media game on point, correct past mistakes, and build a more engaged audience in general. So this tip is kind of about making New Year's resolutions nice. about social media. So some resolutions you might want to make, and you're allowed to make them even if this is after January 1st. It's still the new year. Fresh start. Um, Do some new stuff. For example, if you are looking to expand your audience, you can resolve to follow one or five or 25, but please not more than 25 new targeted accounts every single day. Um, Like it's a good habit to get in. Just every day, follow some new accounts up to 25. Um, that you think might be interested in you. And then um, you should unfollow inactive or non-reciprocal followers every two weeks or so using a third-party app. Like just go through and unfollow people who aren't following you back or people who haven't posted in six months or whatever. There are apps that help you do this, like Crowdfire and other things. And it's just a simple best practice. Make it a habit in 2017 if you're trying to expand your audience. You can also resolve to be more social. Just, you know, take time to read and respond to your timeline without plugging your own stuff. You know, just take some time to be on social media, seeing what other people are saying and interacting with their content. It doesn't have to be all about you all of the time. And relatedly, you can resolve to take a deep dive into groups and hashtags to see what's out there that's relevant to your work and your project and get out there and join the conversation. Um, you can resolve to start using Twitter, Facebook, and or Instagram analytics and actually track that data. You know, all of these platforms give you a lot of information about what you're posting, who's interacting with it, how much, when, where, all of that. You can make a spreadsheet, um, you know, and actually see, you know, like, this content got a good reaction, what time of day was it, what platform was it on, was there a image was there not any other factors that you're trying to see how they actually work like you know start a google doc or an excel sheet or whatever it is and actually you know start capturing that data and find out you know get scientific with it um you can also resolve to engage sustainably and practice self-care that's a really important one now and forever and i'm sure in the beginning of 2017 that's going to be a real important one um and what i mean by Engaging sustainably and practicing self-care is in part like realize your limits, take breaks, step away. If you have other people you can turn to with your project, do what Sean and I do all the time and just like ask the other person to take the wheel for a little bit if you need a break. You can block and mute people who are jerks or just annoying noise because you do not owe random assholes your attention. Uh, You can take the apps off your phone temporarily or permanently if that's helpful and possible for you. And just generally think seriously about what's really possible. Like, you know, I said, like, take them off your phone if it's possible. And you might think like, oh, that's not possible for me, though, because I, you know, use social media professionally and I need to be able to check it on the bus. Do you really, though? Is it like weighing you down? Is it stressing you out? Is it really worth being able to check social media every time you're on the bus to have it on your phone? Or might it be better to keep it something that you do when you're only sitting in front of your computer to work? Sean, are you? do you have something to say about that? You're leaning towards the mic. I mean, we do social media stuff and I took most of mine off like right after the election and I've only put back on Twitter and Instagram. So, so yeah. Life and, goes on. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. 
yeah. life goes on and we still have a social media presence because exactly. yeah you know like so just think seriously about what's really possible what you really need to do not just this feeling of like should that i have all the time oh i should be checking this constantly i should you know it, it's a trap it's not good it's like we all need to take care of ourselves and being constantly plugged in can be extremely draining and as Sean and I have both been saying a lot recently, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And you want to be in it for the long haul, we want to stay connected to you for the long haul. We want you out there expressing yourself and doing your work for the long haul. So protect yourself. And those those are a few resolutions you might want to make. You know, most of them are obviously aimed at like expanding your audience and like improving your engagements. But that last one about self-care is probably the most important one to my mind. So yeah, that's my social media tip for the episode it was kind of long that's okay i tuned it out cool cool <laughs> you guys weren't listening right <laughs> i was i was it was very rich and thorough thank you i'm sorry you didn't use the time to take a nap because that's another <laughs> thing we probably all need <coughs> i'm fine i'm fine i have coffee I'm, I'm gonna be coughing throughout today like well, I'll try to like. That's okay. Yeah. I'll turn on the coughing filter. <laughs> <laughs> beep boop boop. I'll go. Boop, yeah. Beep beep boop. It's 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 you know we have to keep Sean on his yeah. toes with the editing. Okay. Exactly. So perfect. Social media. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So um, our guest this episode is is Hayun Park, and uh, for those people who don't know you and your work, can you tell us a little about bit about who you are and what kind of projects you've you've worked on over the last couple of years? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm an actor, writer, and filmmaker, um, and an occasional erotic clown performer. Uh, I uh, came to New York about ten years ago to become an actor, and I uh, started writing material for myself about five years ago now. So the last few years has been about. Um, I made a web series called Hey On. Uh, I made two seasons of it, and I just finished post-production on a new web series called BKPI, uh, which Nicole here worked as art director, So that, and Sean participated as well. Um, so yeah, I just kind of go around New York City uh, trying to find opportunities to act and create stories. Cool. Yay. So uh, t- tell us a little bit about... Um... The Heian web series is, uh, it's not just like, so many web series are, uh, so somebody in there, series, there's so yeah. many, but yeah. there's so many that are like, oh, it's me and my, my roommate and our kooky, like, shout, like, fights over the shower or something like yeah. that. Yeah, oh, that sounds what, actually fun. Th- well, you we should do that. <laughs> you did uh, that. That's great. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, like, what what sort of was your, I think Heian, the series is is narratively interesting coming from your perspective Mm -hmm. of uh, being in New York. What kind of stories were you telling in there? Why? Yeah. um, Let's see. So I made a short film called Sumi uh, prior to making the web series. And, you know, it was was a long year or longer than a year of um, labor of love. And it was great. And we were... uh, my producing partner at that time and I were submitting to film festivals and it was great, but I got really frustrated at how um, limiting that festival circuit can be to just get your work seen. And now I have, I know a lot more festivals and a lot uh, better ways of connecting with people at that time. It was all new for me. So it was just like, Oh my God, what's all this submission fee and all this like work. And then even when you get in, you can't, you know, you can't share it with other people until it premieres and all that stuff. So um, my impetus for making um, the Hey On web series was like, okay, whatever the next thing I make, I'm just going to put it up online. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was influenced by um, other web series like F to 7th uh, and just a lot of like New York-based shows. And I was obsessed with uh, Louis C.K.'s show. And I grew up mostly in Korea, so I didn't really grow up with stand-up comedy. So kind of watching Louis' show was like a deep dive into stand-up comedy. So I was like really like hungry for it, going to open mics myself. So I said, 
what if I do what Louisa Kay does, like write something, direct it, and act a version of myself. So um, the the logline of this show is, uh, it's Han is a comedy about a, an angry, whimsical Korean woman. And um, yeah, I have a lot of whimsy, but a lot of rage. <laughs> so, and I'm still, I still, I think I'm still pretty angry. Um, I'll probably be angry forever. But yeah, at that time, it was just uh, grabbing nuggets from my life and from my fantasies of what kind of things make me angry and um, make me uh, curious. Yeah. I, I remember seeing the first episode of your series before we met or before I even knew who you were, the hipster racism one, yeah. and just being like, oh, there, there's that. Th- I've been in that conversation. I might have even been the person who was saying those things in that conversation, but like <clears throat> there was a certain um, – the uh, discomfort <laughs> yeah yeah it's very uncomfortable humor but it's also very like uh relatable like like you feel like that's like a real situation it's not like watching friends or something like that where i have no idea what it would be like to mm-hmm. to for your friend's monkey to i don't know do whatever the hell happened on an episode of friends yeah but but you know you're in those conversations during brunch <clears throat> and it's yeah, basically, um, and this was based on what really actually happened to me, you know, at a friend's brunch party, and a and a and a friend's boyfriend just as a joke calls me, oh, a Korean au pair because I was holding my friend's child, toddler child, um, and then in real life, I so this is a little embarrassing, but um, partly because English is my second language, I didn't know what an au pair was, so I honestly thought that he was calling me a oh there's our Korean old pal I thought that's <laughs> awkward but I'll go with it um and then when they left the kid's mom who's a friend of mine said oh my god that was a little weird he called you an au pair and I, st- I said what's an au pair and I went right on google and looked up what au pair was and then I kind of, it's kind of spiraled into a, a thing and I'm I'm kind of dumb so at that time I didn't even know what the term microaggression meant really so it you know I it, it it turned into like I wanted to have a conversation with him about it but he didn't want to so it um it it was a gift <laughs> gave me great material so the episode itself was kind of um a version a fantasy version of it of me wanting to stand up for myself and uh, fantasizing a friend standing up for me as well mm-hmm. yeah. It's one of the great things about filmmaking or web series making same thing that you get to like uh, kind of therapeutically reimagine real life situations yeah. and have them resolve differently. I, th- yeah, that I, I love that shit. It's such a, it's been helpful to me. It's so, great. Yeah. And when I was um, right out of acting school, I studied with a lot of serious like theater teachers and um, I had this big judgmental voice inside of me when I decided I'm going to make a show about myself, which sounds like the most self-indulgent thing in the world. Um, I was thinking, oh, that's not art. It's just uh, me taking what really happens and like transcribing it. And that's not art. It felt um, like a gimmick. But the more and more I do it, I think it's amazing. Absolutely. And what's most personal is most universal. So absolutely Um, yeah well i'm just thinking about the first time sean and i met Mm -hmm. it was rather um romantic oh Oh, what did i do (laughs) no no, because we met up for coffee and we sat on on a bench on eastern parkway right 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 right. uh, i loved it we were just talking about you sean you had reached out to me on twitter yeah after i watched that episode yeah so Um, it was just like i love that was the beginning of like me like really enjoying connecting with with fellow new york brooklyn artists yeah. That's, so you guys met on Twitter? Yes. Yeah. I don't know if I quite knew that. Yeah. I, um, the producer of uh, mm-hmm. the Hey Young web series was somebody who I, who I knew and had helped on a couple things, but I wouldn't say necessarily worked with. Mm. And uh, she shared the um, she shared the first episode, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna click. I, I was looking for things to watch. Gotcha. Uh, and that w- when when it came out, and so I clicked it and I watched, and I was like, this is great. And I started following Hey Yun and saying, oh, this is very funny. And, and, yeah. and, and then we said, like, let's have coffee. And then we mm-hmm. actually had coffee, which mm-hmm. is 
always one of those things that happens. It's like, let's have coffee. Let, let's do that. Let's let's do that. Like and how then, many people right now currently do we have ongoing conversations, each of us, of like, oh, we should grab coffee. Oh, yeah. It's Countless. crazy, right? Countless. There, Countless. Yeah. <laughs> at least five or six. <laughs> there's different categories, though. There are the people where I say that and I 100% mean it mm-hmm. and, like, really do and, some you know, try to make it happen. And then there are the ones where it's a thing you say because you feel like you have to say it. And you kind of don't exactly. You never do that. That's good. If I say I want to have coffee with you, I want to have coffee Uh with you. However, it shouldn't be interpreted as if I don't say that, that I don't want to. So it's like, Mm. it's like, but if I say it, I mean it. I just don't want, I just won't always follow up. Yeah, Um, sure. Like the degree of my follow up is the indication of exactly how interested I am in it. I will pursue it more Mm -hmm. if I'm more, if I'm more like, yeah, we have to do this now. Uh, but you know, there's plenty of people where I'm like, we should have coffee sometime. And that could be in like five years. But if yeah. I, but if I don't want to have coffee with you, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> or if, or people will say, yeah, let's have coffee together. Be like, sure. Yeah. Sure. And if I don't want to, like, I'm just never going to follow up on that. I have, that's funny. I, I, I think 80% of the time I mean it when I say that. Yeah. But 20% of the time I have great anxiety over like saying Bye or ending a conversation. Oh God, yes. Oh yeah. Whether that's in whether that's in person or on the phone, so it's it's terrible. Like recent, like some of my friends have caught up on that. So especially on the phone, they say that oh, like I have the most abrupt buys, yeah. or it's just extremely elongated. Yeah. So yeah, like sometimes you just like bye, have, have oh, have a good weekend, and I just don't know how to stop. So maybe we should have coffee. Right. Yeah. We should go to a buffet <laughs> it just goes on <laughs> i so relate to that i re- I'm, I'm bad with goodbyes too i hate goodbyes like they just make me feel awful yeah. and so i i like to either do like an irish goodbye and just like peace out without like saying like sometimes i will do that and it's not i know that can be interpreted as being rude but it's, i like it okay good and a lot of people like it like yeah. a lot of my friends like we've talked about and they're like yes that's the way to do it but Otherwise, I'll do that same thing sometimes if I just draw it out God, and yeah. I just and I don't know what it is. I like I just don't feel like I can cut the cord or something. Sometimes it gets so it just goes on and on. So it ends up being like, oh, we should go to a Korean spot together. <laughs> like This is somebody who I totally like don't have that kind of intimacy with. But let's go on vacation together. <laughs> let's make some plans let's right go now. Swim. Yeah. What does let's that say swim. about us? Are we just I don't know. socially awkward? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I, I, I think there's just. With a lot of people, there's just sort of a... Because I do similar things. I have a hard time saying goodbye, and I either get very abrupt or I just disappear. If, if it's a large group situation, it's much more likely that I'm just going to disappear. I like uh, it. And then I like yeah. the text message. Like I like the nice, um, like, oh, it was great seeing you. I had to run out. I appreciate it when somebody mm-hmm. even does that to me. I don't think it's rude. I, I, Same. I, I, I need to do the text message thing afterwards more often. That's, that's, that's a piece of the puzzle I've been leaving out. Mm-hmm. Because then it's like actually a little bit more polite but yeah i think a lot of people just don't like like how do you end a conversation without seeming like you don't <clears throat> want like you're not trying to say like i don't want to talk to you anymore yeah i think i yeah. think that's probably part of it is just the is just the i still want to talk to you but i also don't want to talk to you right now anymore well also you can't have a single conversation go on literally forever so it yeah. does need to end at some point yeah but yeah I, we all have problems with this can i bring it back to sue me for a second yeah which you is should. how we yeah um because I think I first connected with you through Christina Rea because yes. Christina Rea was like, oh, you know, you should meet Hey Yun. She like did this like short film about mm-hmm. phone sex because I listeners too have made a short film about phone sex. And I can say that Sumi is, I think, my favorite short film about phone sex that I did not write and direct myself. Oh, that's amazing. Well, it's really good. It's on Seed and Spark, right? It's yeah, I think it still is. Maybe not. Um, but. Yeah, I that was the first uh, short film I wrote, and um, I had a friend uh, Rachel Grace direct it, and we produced it together. Yeah, yeah, that that was you've seen that, right, Sean? Yes, I have. Yeah. I, I watched it not long after. Oh my god, that was watching four years ago. Yeah, yeah, but it, um, I well, let's. I want to talk about your film too, but oh, um, well, that's that's amazing that you you. You, that means a lot coming from it you. It was very, for listeners, I recommended, I believe it's on Seed and Spark because I linked it um, recently when I was writing a review of For a Good Time Call, which is another film about phone cool. sex that I reviewed for Tits and Sass, which is a sex worker run 
blog and I was mentioning other films in it that, you know, dealt with this subject matter. And I was saying like the one that I kind of without reservations recommend is Sue Me. And I believe I linked it on Seed and Spark. So I think you can all watch it there. You can. Um, you have to subscribe to Seed and Spark in order to yes, watch it. Yes, and you though. should because Seed and Spark is amazing. And you can then see Sue Me, which, you know, otherwise you're just going to be like, well, what's this other short film? Yeah. That's like the best Short film about phone sex, not written, directed by Nicole Solomon. So I have a question, Nicole. Have you? Do you see a lot of films and short films about phone sex that are bad and you feel like is just not authentic? I, I don't see a lot at all. Um, of the ones that I see, it's... I mean, there are a few that I... Not short so much. Um, sometimes it'll like come in as like a subplot, but mm. it's more features that I've seen and there aren't really any that I just unreservedly recommend Mm, mm. um they like like i mean i like girl six i'm a Mm -hmm. fan of girl six girl six also has a like weird judgmental like kind of cautionary tale Mm. twist it takes that i don't feel great about um and they're just a lot where yeah it's inauthentic Mm -hmm. in one way or another it's just like that doesn't happen or you know it's like i mean i could run through now my like the canon of phone sex films and my feelings mm. about them, but maybe that's not the best use that of should time. Be a, that should be another, like, special. That could be a special. Both argument. of you just running through cans of things that you don't like. <laughs> I mean... Or maybe that happens already. <laughs> it's a lot of things. Uh, it's a lot of things I don't like. But I liked I, I liked Sumi, though, because it felt realistic. It felt non... Like, because sometimes there will be a level of judgment going mm. on that I don't like, or it's not realistic or it's like not rooted in the experience of doing that kind of work. It's more mm-hmm. rooted in, you know, like um, punch drug love, for example, has a like uh, phone sex subplot. That's very much about this, mm-hmm. like certain kind of like male paranoia and fear of like women and women's sexuality that permeates the film in different ways, including like he has a uh, calls a phone sex line and the phone sex operator ends up like running a scam on him mm-hmm. in a way that like, I'm sure that's happened. You know, I'm sure there are phones like that. Don't look at me. Like, like, <laughs> <laughs> we both you. looked at Sean. Yeah. Like, uh, like I've either been trapped in one or done one to somebody. <laughs> I'm picturing you actually. Obviously like, the latter. But yeah. <laughs> exactly. I grew up in the internet age. I don't use the phone. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. It is mostly older, yeah. older gentlemen well, these um, days. Yeah. So yeah, Sumi is, is uh, basically about a, a woman who's an, uh, a painter, but she... Uh, um, what you gonna call it? Uh, oh, I kind of forgot what that film was about. Oh, so her, her date, her. Uh, in order to make rent, she teaches English on the phone to uh, students in Asia, and they're like little ten minute lessons. And she realizes that oh, there's a lot of lonely, horny men on the other end of the line. So she sets up a separate phone line and and uh, teaches English through phone sex. So, 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 so there's a lot of like. Oh, like, let me tell you what titties mean. <laughs> um, and so and she's very, like, paranoid about her roommate finding out what she actually does. But it turns out her roommate, who's a piano teacher, also has a secret of his own. So uh, the whole thing was shot in my apartment that I was living in at that time. And uh, it was it was great. It was like everybody was working for free and we were cooking together. And um, yeah, super special. Yeah, and the film has just, it's a very nice, I, I feel like it's a, a, positive isn't exactly the right adjective, but it's a very, like, human, empathetic mm-hmm. film in general, like, um, in terms of all of the characters involved. It's And that's rare and nice, and I think you captured some of the ways that that kind of um, interaction can be very, I'm saying human again, I haven't had enough coffee today, <laughs> the words aren't coming. It's very human. Yeah. Um, kind of, almost tender in a way. Yeah. It's not whereas so often if you're, but but without being, I thought like overly romanticizing and like that's right. not believable. Like it's you know, it's not that your character is some sort of like angel of yeah. you know sex talk or something uh-huh. like that. But um, it's also not portrayed as being like sordid and dirty and mm-hmm. like ooh you know like you don't want to have anything to do with that. That's yeah. like gross and ugh, you know which like it can be and obviously my film deals with the grosser side a lot but also I tried to balance that by having some more like benign like Mm -hmm. um because it's not I don't view it as something that's bad or dirty or gross it's it's connection yeah and um before I made this film I was actually teaching English on the phone 
and it was so bizarre uh it a lot of it was this was a like a korean company and a lot of um koreans i can say are like since like the early 90s have been obsessed about english so a lot of people just want to practice conversational english with um a native speaker so the company that hired me knew that i was korean but they <coughs> excuse me they insisted that i pretend to be like a blonde like blue-eyed american chick so that the, the students will feel more feel like they're getting more out of it <laughs> that's right an amazing parallel to <coughs> straight phone sex because that's the same thing yeah the, I, so that's yeah. why like i've never actually done phone sex but that was like it was based on that experience and sometimes these like People, students would ask incredibly inappropriate questions mm -hmm. and uh but it was at the end of the day it was about connection and i actually was really surprised by how how big of a connection i was able to make with some of these people i would talk like 10 minutes a day and some of them like once a week even yeah but it's like this intense 10 minutes that's focused on this thing and that somehow opens yeah. something up in them and or something. It you does. Know? That's so interesting. I had one occasion where one of the students, um, she was going through an abusive uh, relationship with her husband and she just started like sharing all these details and I was trying to really help her and I knew that the company was recording all of it but then um, with my cell phone, I called her um, and I kind of confessed that I'm, I'm Korean and I started speaking to her in Korean, like, I can help you. Let's try to, like, think about it. And I think she freaked out. I think mm -hmm. the protection for her of, like, I'm talking to a complete foreigner uh, was her way of, um, like, feeling safe, sharing her story. So I yeah. feel bad that I stepped that, um, overstepped that boundary. But, yeah, it, it got so intense and I was so obsessed and invested in how can I like help her yeah that's so hard when I mean we could go on a whole we could take this interview to a very far away from social media place because this is so interesting to me um but about when you have that sort of professional iron ironclad boundaries of sorts relationship it, within which there is this space for like this very real intimacy but yeah. there's this kind of inherent limit yeah to it because that makes complete sense what you like I I feel for you in doing that so much and yeah. like wanting to help and you know that makes sense as a thing to do but I also get why that would like make her shut down yeah because it was those boundaries that allowed her to open up within mm -hmm. them and the second that was violated it's like mm -hmm. she must have just panicked you know I think that's similar to what we do as artists too a lot of times people who watch and uh, experience our the art that we make like they feel they resonate and feel healed by it because it's in the boundary of um of an art project and Absolutely. then when somebody actually tries to like oh get into more um like real life solutions it shuts them down mm -hmm. and i think i respect that like yeah that right now you're in a space where you can only <sighs> kind of like work through it with um the boundaries of a fictional art or yeah oh man i could so Tell some yeah, we, we won't go. No, too no, no. That's it's so good. But I'm just I, it gets my now my yeah. brain's going. But I'm thinking about like that's like on phone sex calls. Like I could tell some stories about some of the like <clears throat> stuff callers will work through in S and M scenarios. But then when you have conversations with them about like, well, why don't you have a conversation with your girlfriend? Which is a conversation I've had many times. Where yeah. I'm like, and they're like, no, no, I can only talk to you. And I'm like, no, but have you tried talking to your girlfriend? Uh -huh. Well, no, because I can't. Because she'll act this way. Well, have you ever given her the chance to react? And say, no. <clears throat> well, maybe before you psychically think you know exactly how she'll react. You know, whatever. That's, that's so fascinating. Yeah. But it is. It's that space that's created because, and uh -huh. similarly, phone sex is kind of like a fictional yeah, fantasy it world. Is. That's similar to like creating yeah. a film that somebody can empathize with the characters in and be able to explore some stuff. But then once it's back out into their real life, it's like yeah. shut down. Nope. You know, have to fall back on your various... Um, habits that you're used yeah. to that can keep you stuck it's in no whatnot. longer role play i know sean has questions though yeah oh, no, I, I took i know we're I trying no it's great this is what I, <laughs> oh. I love podcasts when people just go on tangents like they like get lost in their own passion you know oh no stop having your really interesting conversation <laughs> stop connecting with the guest what is wrong with you oh my god all the things that i had as conversation starters are so much more important <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's talk about Twitter instead. <laughs> Twitter and oh, I do want to talk about Instagram story though. Great. Oh yeah, talk about it. Just in fact, here, let's go live while you talk about it on Instagram. Okay. Well, it might not be good because I'm like, I, I enjoy watching other people's Instagram story, but I don't feel like, I, like what, how do you guys use it? Like I don't, I haven't used it yet. I barely use it. Sean has used it a little more. Um, I haven't really been using it. I similarly, it never occurs to me to do it. It never occurs to me that like, oh, this would make a good Instagram story. But then it occurs to me to like, in just regular Instagram. Yeah, I me too. I wonder why, maybe it's extra, st- I feel the need to like, put a catchy like, caption or like, put a little thing and then I think, then I like, oh, forget it. Also, the other thing is for me as like, a f- as a filmmaker... I feel like when anytime I'm doing video, like some pressure to have it not look like shit. Mm -hmm. And if you're just doing like a little Instagram story, like the amount of time it takes to like set up the shot so it like looks good or whatever, I get, you know, neurotically overwhelmed and I'm like, just never mind. But I do want to try it because I'm all about trying stuff out. But I think it's also like coordination. Mm. A lot of people are good at like interacting and like doing but then when I start interacting with it, like this phone goes over here so then I just get a shot of like the sky not what's happening here um cat calling sucks yeah. shouting this out Diana owes my lingerie play shirt <laughs> check her out at mylingerieplay.com good job on the Instagram story to <laughs> turn that into a promo reel it's good, well, it's good. Um, I'm, this is the first time I've experimented with um, Instagram live Oh, is that oh, what you're doing? That's what I'm doing. Oh, It'll so it's disappear. Not a story. It's live. This isn't a story. This is the live, which appears in the same oh. spots as the which story. Which I another That's thing I haven't confusing. used. Yeah, this is like Periscope, basically. Yeah. Like Snapchat. No. No. Stories no, no, the is stories like, is like stories Snapchat. Stories is like oh. Snapchat. This is like Periscope or Facebook Live more. So yeah. basically there's an whenever there's a new app, all the other companies just what do you call it? copy copy it and add on to it i hate it personally because it's like why does every platform want to be every platform it's like every social media platform needs to do everything that every other one is doing i guess because they want competition yeah and i mean i get like facebook wants to have a monopoly right facebook wants to be as i've said before aol in the 90s basically like the like you get your internet through Facebook mm-hmm. is kind of what they want. And mm-hmm. that's why their algorithm is designed to like encourage you to upload your content directly to Facebook. So you yeah. don't like have to go to YouTube to watch a video. You're just watching it on Facebook. You're getting right. your live streams on Facebook. You're getting your photos on Facebook. You're get you know, you're reading articles through the weird Facebook link of when you post things to Facebook that does something I don't know exactly what that like gives Facebook more <laughs> Facebookiness. I don't know. Um now I'm caffeinated. Woo. Um. <laughs> Are you still recording? Yeah. Well, it, well, it's not even recording. I think it just, that's the difference with the Instagram live is it, I, my understanding is once I hit end, it just disappears. Nobody watches it. Well, actually a couple well, people have looked at it. Hi. Um, All things Soundgarden who won the, one of that little contest of, <coughs> of, um, Chris, 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 Chris photo. Uh, of Chris and, Cornell, I believe. Yeah, mm-hmm. Chris Cornell. Chris and Chris. And Christina Rea joined for like a second and then mm-hmm. she disappeared. And then somebody who I don't know who they are okay. showed up and also it was gone. So nobody's looking at it right now. <laughs> but I'm just like panning between the two of you. And it's right. it's interesting. I just haven't played with it before. And since you mentioned the Instagram stories. Yeah. And I was thinking like, let's play with this because it will disappear. Supposedly. Well, well, uh, you guys have been doing this for a while, and you've like garnered an audience. And how has it been for you in the last year since um, since starting the podcast and forming the company? Like, well, that's a vague question. Um, has your relationship to social media changed since you started um, partnering together for Four Mile Circus? I mean, for me, I think it's become like it's sort of the same thing where it it is both sort of entertaining, but also a task of like of like doing business, which mine has been like particularly something like Facebook, which I do not particularly care for the manner of interaction there is in Facebook. Um, Like I've maintained Facebook for years because of 
both like just having sort of a vague connection to people who like I used to go to high school with who maybe we want to talk about something at some point, but usually not. Uh, or, uh, or just like, well, I have a project coming up and that's a way that mm-hmm. people connect. Twitter has always been the only one where I actually liked being conversational. Mm. Instagram, I've never, I didn't grow up like taking a whole lot of pictures anyway. Like I don't mm. have a whole lot of pictures. So even now it's like, a, oh yeah, I should take a picture of this or I should do a, mm. a stream of this or that. Like it's not part of the, my backdrop. So Twitter, uh, but I think in certain respects, like it became a little easier because as far as like the business side, I've been able to separate a little bit more of like, my personal Twitter account from the business account Mm. and also just be able to say, like share the responsibility of, of doing things and also have like a separate brain. Like I can take over doing certain things like creating graphics, which I didn't do a whole lot of before because like, I was also thinking about like, what the fuck am I going to tweet or what the fuck am I going to share on Facebook? Uh, (coughs) while, you know, you know, we can kind of split the, the responsibilities, which I think has been, like in teaming up, I think that's been the main difference for me. Yeah, same. I think. So sorry, I'm just gonna so you can edit it out. Oh, <coughs> thank you. Oh. That is so responsible of you. <coughs> I'm not gonna edit it. Out. And then yeah. can... I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think for me the main difference also has to do with like having a partner that you are working in tandem with because I've done like quite a bit of professional social media work over like the past years like it's been for at least the past couple years a consistent thing of up until like six months ago or so I always had at least one um like everyday client where Mm -hmm. I was like doing social media on their behalf Twitter Facebook Instagram mostly um sometimes more than one but like you know, sometimes several on top of my own projects that I was, um, you know, doing in a like semi-professional fashion, like whether it's because I was like promoting a film or trying to crowdfund it or whatever it was, it was something that was very much like a scheduled work thing, not a Mm -hmm. for fun or just social connection thing. Um, So starting Four Mile Circus was just kind of almost like, oh, here's my new social media client, except Mm -hmm. it's me and Sean collectively. Right. But the difference is before, always, like, the buck kind of just stopped with me in terms of, like, making sure everything was, like, cranking along and we had a consistent presence and we're optimizing things and doing things in a way that encouraged growth and worked well and stuff like that. And I usually didn't have anyone I was working with who knew more than I did, for example. Like, so I could kind of do whatever unless I had a boss who, for various reasons, didn't want me to do things that made sense to do for no good reason. But... We won't talk about that. Um, but uh, like, you know, but with Sean, like I, there's another person. So if I if like I was saying before, if one of us needs to take a break, mm. we're, we're very like, I think part of why we work well together is we really communicate and we kind of understand, I think, that both of us being good like helps each other like it's Mm. you know so so good yeah it's i mean it's crucial honestly (laughs) if you want to have a sustainable business partnership or create a partnership or anything um so if one of us is like i can can you like take on more of the social media load or can you deal with facebook for a month because i need you know i've got this project going on or i just need a break or whatever it is we're pretty upfront with each other about that. And that's nice and new because I've never had that before because it's always been like, if I don't do it, it doesn't get done. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was, that's been educational and a change. Uh Yeah. Um, But so so, uh, which, which do you use? I know you're not really, you're on social media, but it's not like a main thrust of things that you do. If I, unless I'm Oh, I mean, as a DIY, um, creator for sure like the only reason uh i was get i was able to get hey on the web series seen was was social media um yeah i'm I'm on facebook instagram twitter i'm on there but i never got the hang of it so now i just have it my facebook linked to twitter so that it's not completely inactive Mm -hmm. um but then again like twitter is a great place to connect with people that are not in your like physical vicinity like um 
I, I made a whole bunch of friends, uh, Asian American artist friends in LA because of the hashtag, not your Asian sidekick a yeah. few years ago. I just hopped on it. It was a couple of months after I launched this first season of Hey Yan. So, um, Jenny Yang, the amazing comedian, um, got to see it, promoted it. And then through her, I got to meet a whole bunch of great friends. Um, the only reason I'm, I'm still toying with the idea of, of just trying out living in LA for a little bit, but if I didn't have those friends I got to meet through that hashtag, I don't think I could even imagine trying to live there. Um, so yeah, Twitter is great, but I'm not so active there. Um, but Instagram, I love just cause it's usually most of the time Facebooking or Instagram mean for just my own pleasure or just to promote work. It never feels like work mm -hmm. for me. It's just pure like excitement of sharing the work and, um, promoting friends and community. So yeah, I, I am pretty active. I, I do have some friends who are like, we're a little sick of you on social media. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but you, you've also used, um, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, you've also used like in re real in person networking as well for for things like hey on uh, if I remember right, uh, it was your acting classes. You, yeah, you pulled a lot of a lot of collaborators from that. Yeah. What was the acting class? And the acting class is uh, my mentor and good friend uh, Deborah Campmeyer, who is an amazing filmmaker. Uh, she made films like Virgin and Hound Dog, um, and she uh, I was actually a part of the ensemble of her um, last feature film Split. She's been teaching for ages, and I met her in the conservatory acting school that I went to, and um, yeah, she's. She's been my main teacher for the last eight years, and I just meet amazing artists in that class. So most of the actors that I cast in my my um, my films are from that class, and uh, other collaborators as well. Uh, the one like I, I highly recommend her. She has an ongoing class. Um, you can search it. Um, Deborah Campmeyer Scene Study Class. She her class is amazing because she basically teaches actors um how to direct themselves in essence because mm. it is especially like i think um it's hard to come across a really great director who knows how to communicate with actors so she's uh her work is just really amazing in that way and um i recommend this class to a, like any artist whether you're a dancer a poet a writer because it's i think at the core of it is um, learning how to like bring your essence to the work. This sounds like hippy dippy, but I really honestly don't think I would have started making my own work without her guidance and just being in the space that she encourages artists. And I mean, I can say from having watched you work on set, it seems like you're very good at communicating with actors and being able to get um, some really subtle work. Oh, thank you. That I well, it was great for me to watch because I've never. I mean, I'm not an actor, but. Um, I, you know, like acted when I was a kid and like I have a side of me that likes to perform and I can't imagine directing something and performing in it at the same time and watching how you negotiated mm -hmm. that was really educational for me. Oh, cool. um, you made it seem easy, which I know it wasn't. Um, and because it can't have been. Um, and yeah, and you get some really just nuanced, subtle, like quiet moments yeah out of actors but that are really like grounded in like they're they're doing something they're there they're in yeah. the moment and um but they're not you know doing anything showy or anything like that and you just kind of like let it sit and let that show yeah. in the frame um and so watching that on the monitor and like seeing what you were doing and what you had done to get to that point was like a class a master class for oh, me while that's I was so on sweet <laughs> that's so sweet um it's whatchamacallit, um, I, I just, oh, hold on, maybe we'll edit this out, let me just get my thoughts together, <laughs> um, it's, it's easy and it's hard, but, and I, I still have such a long way to go, I feel like this time shooting BKPI, because I had so much, I had a great producer and, like, the most support that I had, I was able to focus on the acting and the directing, and previously, I feel like I'm just like hectically wearing different hats right. and just 
going with the flow and trying to be as present as possible as possible um but yeah I love that process of just communicating and and um and a lot of times too I'm not precious about my own words that I write so oftentimes when actors suggest great ideas like I have no issue of like just like listening to them and taking like thank you for that gift you know if they're bringing something in that'll make the, the project better the story better um it's amazing but yeah it was actually like it was it was the most the, this time working on pkpi directing and acting like i felt like i got my hands on the most so um it was really gratifying i loved it i think this is part of why you were so convincing as a phone sex worker in sue me um <laughs> Honestly, because I, because I, I've, I've said, and people are like, haha, that's a funny line, but I'm like, no, I really mean it. Um, that doing phone sex taught me so much about how to direct actors mm-hmm. and people are like, haha. And I'm like, no, because it's about getting to that place of really communicating and yeah. a kind of openness and a kind of improvisational, um, collaboration, um, which, you know, that was a big breakthrough for me when I'm like, oh, directing is collaboration. You're not telling somebody else what to do. You're opening yourself up to what they're bringing. Mm-hmm. And then the two of you are kind of finding your way together to yeah. what's going to make the strongest thing. And I get I get that from you that you're like, so there yeah. with that. And I think that's part of why, like, in this little short film, he, interestingly enough, like this other profession that and in part, in part also, obviously, because you were doing the like, uh, language lessons, which is like mm-hmm. very related and similar, but mm-hmm. like that you were able to portray this other like specific skill set very convincingly yeah. because it's so similar and so connected. Mm-hmm. I oh, this is such a love fest. I'm getting all <laughs> tingly inside. Thank you, Nicole. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of like, I'd rather just have myself or an actor speak compl- something that it may sound completely monotonous and just nothing I have nothing in me I'd rather have somebody just speak from that place instead of acting with a capital A and putting stuff on it yeah 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 and I think the best directors just are so sensitive and intuitive and catch what's going on like a good director is able to um observe something in an actor that the actor himself or herself may not know yet what's what's bubbling in there it's a lot like being a therapist in a lot of ways, much like perhaps being an over the phone language instructor or a phone sex operator yeah. also is being a direct, you know, it's about like getting to that place with the person and getting them to be able to like open up and not be doing like affected kind of acting tips yeah. or something like that, but getting, to, this is cliche, but like getting to the truth under that yeah. and like getting to that place of truth. Uh-huh. And that's, I can't believe these words are coming out of my mouth. But that's like so, but that's what it is. I think it is. When, when you get those scenes and they're good and you're like, yes. And to be able to do that and on set with all the crew members there, but like create this safe space of, okay, you, the actor and the di- actors and the director, are like, okay, it's just us. Let's try to. And sometimes when you're in, I mean, Sean, you've acted too. So I don't know if you can relate to it, but there, are, there could be a dozen people outside like checking their phones and setting up the lights but when you're in that zone when you really connect I kind of get psyched myself out um and just think oh my god I felt like it was just us yeah I felt that way when we shot the my character Mo's um parents intensely dramatic parent scene in Flushing yep. for BKPI like there was a chunk of the time I forgot that there were people there that was intense yeah that was that was some intense intense shooting yeah and I think it's good because it was a good crew. We were all trying to give you your space. Yeah. You know, to like you guys do your family thing, you know. It was so great. And um, we're jumping all over the place. But no, um, I think that one of my f- the favorite thing about uh, shooting BKPI was just having so many women mm. on set. And I know there are amazing male men filmmakers and like film uh, on set. And the- I don't think so. <laughs> And the uh, very few, I think like our set was like 90% women, I yeah. would say. Yeah. So the few um, dudes that were on set were so sensitive and like they were so there. I love them. Shout out to Kevin Martin and Andre. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they were great. They were great. But like just ha- like it was, it was so palpably nur- like nurturing is such like a gendery word, but like, um, just compassionate 
and easy and warm and um, it couldn't have felt better to just just be vulnerable yeah I'm glad it's good to hear that from your perspective it felt great for me as a crew member being like I was like this is great I would want to be on set more if it was always like this but it's not (laughs) never got heated like no like women I think like also we were just joking like women are just better at problem solvers sometimes (laughs) like (laughs) um so yeah I I would highly recommend I know a lot of people are I'm preaching to the choir here but um hire women Mm -hmm. for film projects or any projects and i have heard some people make the argument of oh but it's hard to seek out women crew members no (laughs) it requires just like a sliver of extra work to if you are only used to the communities where it's mostly um dudes yeah uh it might require just a little bit like nowadays you have social media put it up on facebook and people would fucking tag the shit out of people also really you work in film and you don't know any women who work in film like when people say that shit like i get it's like it's just habits right like oh well my best friends are a bunch of other white dudes so we're just all going to make a film together because they're the best because they're my friends who i'm closest to and most comfortable with but it's like just you know look around a little bit i mean it's new york city yeah it's New York fucking city. Yeah. Like it is not that hard. I'm sorry. Like yeah. it might not be the thing that comes to you first. If you're a certain, but like for me, like obviously like most, like, I mean, I work with men too, but like I work with lots of women, like, cause that's who I know because mm-hmm. that's like who I was fortunate enough to come up working with because of like where I went to school and who I met there and who I met through them. Like it's pretty natural and easy for me, but I would guess even if that hadn't been the case, it wouldn't be that hard. And no. it's, It's such a different thing because it's interesting because when I first started doing video was in high school Mm. because I went to an alternative school where we had a video class and I took it and I was the only girl in it and it was like all dudes otherwise and they were pretty cool dudes. It's not that they were all being like super sexist to me or anything like that. They were actually like pretty like totally nice and normal but just that dynamic Mm -hmm. of being like all the girls took photo. None of the girls took video. Like you could either take the photo class or the video class and all the girls took photo except me. And it, it's this weird dynamic of I felt like, well, shit, I better be good because, like, if I, if I suck at this, then it's, like, not just me, Nicole, sucking. Mm. It's, like, girls suck. Yeah. And, like, that's a shitty feeling. And, I'm, and I've been in that situation a lot in, like, film and video. There's a lot of times where you're, like, the only woman around. Um, but, like, I've created my film life in New York such that that's actually not usually the case for me at all and Mm. it's been great Mm. and so if i can do it others can do it also right Mm. well i uh for my short film that i the first thing that i crowdfunded abel and kane back in 2012 Mm. i posted a craigslist listing for a for a dp i knew a couple of people but i didn't necessarily know anybody who i thought would be like i knew people who did like comedy stuff and i didn't think they'd be interested in what i was doing Mm. uh or they just didn't shoot the way i wanted them to so i posted a thing and I interviewed a couple people, and one of them came in, Rachel Saltzman, uh, who's who is actually like from like she has to like train in from like Poughkeepsie, but she mm. she does a lot of work, and like she's the one who shot it, and I think she did a great job. We haven't really had a chance to work together again mm. uh, recently, but like or like, but like it's not that hard to find somebody if you're yeah. looking. Yeah. Like yeah. if you go like, and if you do like a genuine like outreach for a person, because I wasn't explicitly looking for a woman, but as I was like going through the potential people, I was like, eh, it would probably be a good idea if I, if I, if I, if I, uh, had, my DP was a woman for this particular project, and mm-hmm. so that's 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 where we ended up. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't think it's that hard if you actually try. Yeah. If the, instead of the people who are like, well, it's just hard to find them. Did you just look at your friends and not? Did you just see look in the women? next room where your roommate is yeah. sleeping? Yeah, but th- there's no, there's no. I don't have any roommates that are girls. <laughs> guys, guys. All of the New York crew lives with me. And they they all got dicks. I know. Yeah. I know because we were checking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Check it uh, for Got to check those genitalias. Exactly. That's Always what people important. do, right? <laughs> I don't know. I never really... And it's the only roommate I've ever had, uh, or most for the most part, has been my wife. So. Oh, that's uh, good. That's and, good. Then, and then we've had roommates, but that's uh-huh. different. 
I have no idea what they're going to tell you. But, yeah, just to kind of tie back to social media, for me, a, a huge part of, um, a huge advantage of using social media is practicing inclusivity, which is such, like, a big, big fire for me to be an artist. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, social media has its hiccups and evils, but um, I, I, I'm all for it. Yeah, it's been, you know, and other filmmakers we talked to, too, like Heidi Moore, who we talked to, like, got a lot of her crew for her feature film, Dolly Deadly, through social media. Mm. Like, she had collaborators literally in other countries, like, shooting stuff and sending it to her yeah. for, like, these little video bits they needed and, like, met, met on it's Twitter. It's incredible. My, my pal, Kana Atakeyama, she's making our first short film. She's an actor buddy um, and wrote this beautiful screenplay where... She and her mother, who lives in Japan, are going to act in it as a mother and daughter. And uh, she's in Japan now. She's shooting in a couple of weeks. But she was trying to crew up local hires. And literally, like, she just posted on Facebook. And you have, no, like, so many people just tagged references. And just like that, she hired a DP and um, uh, other crew members. So it's, yeah. Yeah, because people, people in film use social media to get work, you know? Yeah. Like, it's so... If you're looking to reach out, there are people looking to, like, take your hand. Yeah. That's, you know, and I, I I use it, too, for for jobs, for when I'm doing art direction. I use social mm -hmm. media for props a lot. Mm -hmm. I did for BKPI. I'm yeah. doing it for About a Donkey, um, Christina oh, Reyes film now. Yeah. I'm when are they, when do they start shooting? We shoot one day in January, uh -huh. and then we're shooting the rest of it in starting in March on weekends. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's all. I am so in awe of Christina Reyes. She is the best. Jeez. She is. The drive that she has and just oh, so brilliant. She gets it done. Yeah. She gets a lot of shit done. And it's so inspiring. And yeah. on top of that, I don't know how she has that energy. Maybe it's because she is a vegan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that energy. But she, oh, you're a vegan too. Yes, and but I like, and that, that energy. Uh, like, the drive to get your work done, but also to like help others, her like community members to get their work done. It's astonishing. Yeah, she's great. We she's, love you, Christina. We love you, Christina. Thank you uh, for always helping when I you like can you, and we ask you. <laughs> Christina is okay. acceptable, Sean says. You're, you're okay. You're, you're acceptable. <laughs> I would not, I would not, I would not tie you in a bag and throw you into a bag. <laughs> uh, so let's... Mostly because you're too lazy, though. Let's be real. <laughs> also, it's a like, lot of work. Like, she's <laughs> strenuous. She's tiny, but she's yeah. not that tiny. <laughs> she's strong. Yeah. Uh, so let's... Uh, wrap up this first part of the interview and go on to our well we call it a game but it's not really a game but we're calling we call it a game uh yeah. so let's talk about favorite things so it can be favorite things <coughs> right now favorite things forever can be anything pop culture movies tv shows um things that happened doesn't really so what, what kind of favorite anything. things do you have can My, be, literally anything can be your favorite thing. Can I go first? Please. You please do. Um, I, haven't thought I am obsessed with dream analysis. Mm. So I like have I have crazy dreams. Um and I actually yesterday just posted like a long post about what, what the dream was about and a couple of people posted um different interpretations of it. Um but I like I like to do that. I, there's something a little wrong with me, like I would rather sit and like ponder over the dream that I had and try to analyze it than go out and socialize. <laughs> no, right there with you. That makes perfect yeah. sense. Um, and I'm obsessed with the slugs. Mm. I love slugs. Huh. They're um, they're how they reproduce specifically. I feel that yes. There's an amazing YouTube video you can check out if you search leopard slugs mating mm -hmm. uh they mate in such a beautiful way where yeah human mating is just so boring compared to that and i don't know i just love watching them like move hmm. yeah okay those are good dreams those and slugs good. dreams and favorite slugs. Thing. dreams of slugs sometimes yes on friday night i had a dream where there were like hundreds of slugs in it was that good or bad it was good those okay. Good. Very beautiful slugs, yeah. Okay. Good. Good. I don't really dream, and I don't particularly care for slugs, so mm -hmm. that's. But I. But it's okay. <laughs> my favorite thing is my new niece. Aww. Aww. 
Oh, oh. Yeah, that's your cue. That's your cue. Cue, Sean. You're supposed to oh, and she's like oh. Myself. She's my favorite thing. Um, my other favorite thing is complaining about Batman versus Superman, which I just watched, and I'm still complaining about it. Yeah, but like you chose to watch it, you kind of just deserve to have that in your. Head. I know you made the choice. It's yeah. com- that's completely true, I- and I made the choice to keep watching when I was like, this movie is 12 weeks long. Like I've been watching for like a day. It feels like and it, like, it was pretty entertaining to watch you live tweet it. Yeah, I. That's- oh, nice. Oh, I gotta check it out. Yeah. <laughs> you can your live tweets, not the movie. You can yeah. see. You can basically get the movie by. Is this with Ben Affleck? Yes, he was fine. Yeah, he That's was what I've fine, heard. He's fine. But like that, this version of Batman is. Oh, see now I'm going. This Let's version go. of Batman is so shitty that, however, like fine or even sometimes like, oh, he did a good acting there. But like you can't tell because it's in the midst of this crap and it's so bad. And everything that I said was bad about Captain America: Civil War, which I liked. I liked Captain America: Civil War. I was just a little disappointed in how they handled the themes or more like didn't handle the themes that they introduced. And then Batman versus Superman comes up and it's like the exact same themes, except it makes Captain America Civil War look like it was this really in-depth, like, (laughs) you know, grappling with thorny ethical question and questions of governance and authority and blah, 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 blah. Mm. And, but, but Cap, and there was this moment where I thought Batman versus Superman was going to get good where I was like, wait, I'm kind of into this for like 30 seconds now where Holly Hunter's playing this senator who's Mm. talking about how like Superman needs to like come talk to them and like this is what democracy is and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, is this going to be kind of fun and they're going to do the thing that Captain America never actually did? No, because then like a bomb or whatever goes off and Lex Luthor like kidnaps Lois Lane and the senator's dead and that whole plot line's just over. That was just, you know, to like set up the tension between Batman versus Superman so they can whine about each other for the whole fucking movie, have a really underwhelming fight, and then have this like other plot that nobody gives a shit about come in and take mm. up another 12 hours. Right. That's Batman versus Superman. How is, how is Wonder Woman? She's good, but honestly, people think she's so, like, maybe she's fantastic. I'm not dissing her. I have no idea. She was like pretty much the best part of the movie, definitely. But like, look at the standard. Honestly, like she, yeah, like she got to come in and she's always doing something cool, right? And other people aren't doing anything cool. However expensive what's happening on screen is, it's not very cool. I don't get it. Wow. It's, it's fucking trash because Zack Snyder's just trash, basically. He's a terrible director. He's a terrible director and his, like, eye Aww. is, I'm like, how does this look so expensive and so terrible? The only similar thing would be like a Transformers movie or something, uh-huh. kind of, where there's like yeah. Michael Bay a lot happening and you can't follow it and it's like it, at least michael bay likes color yeah no there's no yeah. and like this and it's cliche it's not and like and i've talked to some people who defend this movie and they're like well it's really dark so and i'm like yeah i all my favorite movies are really dark in no, quotes. No, no, no. like that's not the problem the, these movies are not dark in the way that they that they say they no. are this they're is my dumb. problem with some of these officially just yeah dumb. yeah there's no there's just no because you have a dark color palette and and, and they're like a lot of black. We're gonna growl through it. <laughs> so we're gonna put a voice distorter in Batman's yeah, mask right. this time to make him even growlier. It's like to have that kind of a movie be made for that much of money, and then I recently saw Moonlight, mm. and to have like be able to create that kind of a cinematic experience for people, it's like wow. Glad we have our wide spectrum of yeah. <laughs> of choices, but um. But yeah, Moonlight, you know, could be another favorite thing of mine. Although I saw it a few months ago, so it's not as fresh in my mind. Did but you, like, did you see it? it. It's oh so good. You God. need to see it. I think it's like the most beautiful movie I've seen in my adult life, or wow. even like my whole life. I felt like it was such a. Oh, uh, like, I, I. It's they should teach uh, it in film school because I'm like, this is what a film should be. Every single shot yeah. was. It was mesmerizing, and it was. I love that it was such a simple coming of age story but when do we get to see like uh, that coming of age story of a, a gay black man and also with that kind of subtlety you know mm. what i mean like it's not they 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 let they let the character just be the character it's not like an after school mm-hmm. special where there's always other people telling you exactly yeah. what to think or exactly what's going on or like he follows a very clear like morally defined path of mm-hmm. like has a conflict, has a downfall, has a redemption or something like that. He's just 
going through yeah, his life, life and dealing with life shit. Kind of like, I haven't seen Boyhood, but from what I hear, kind of like that movie. But That's a, that's a link later one. That he yeah, so I didn't see it because yeah. that was also 12 hours long. And yeah, not I wasn't like my so much interested in it. But it, was, it, it had a gimmick and the gimmick was sort of interesting because they shot it over that long period of yeah. time with the same kid, but the story wasn't particularly interesting. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Do you have a favorite thing? Did you do one? I haven't done one. Oh. What's your favorite thing? Uh, Elevator, which is a... Oh, I haven't watched that yet. Should I watch that? It's it's pretty entertaining. It's it's a game show okay. uh, hosted by the Soska sisters. And it's, um, it's basically a game version of doing a haunted house. So they bring these people in and and there's and i've always had like a little bit of trouble with like reality tv that's horror themed whether it's like ghost hunter stuff where they're always making shit up which annoys the hell out of me i'm like you know what at least if you're gonna do stuff like that like be honest about it don't be like we think it's haunted you you like whistled like when nobody was looking and we're like oh it's a ghost and uh, but uh or or ones where they like set people up <coughs> uh into scary situations like without with them being like unwilling or something like that i don't like those because the the latter one is definitely wrong because you can hurt people psychologically this you, people could also be like maybe psychologically harmed but they volunteer to do it they apply to do it as little teams so it's like it's not like an unwilling thing necessarily but they these people they get in this elevator elevator uh and uh there's a different scenario each episode with a storyline and like one was an H.H. H. Holmes based one, the Chicago serial killer with the uh, hotel where with all the secret rooms. Pro tip, don't watch the documentary about him on Netflix. It's pretty, it's not that great. No, no, there's I th- it's, it's okay. probably the same one that's on Amazon, which we watched, which is just it's just sort of cheap. It's from like the 90s and it's all 4.3 and stuff yes. like that. Yeah, I watched yeah, I that. Yeah, I think that's the one. Recently. Where can you watch Elevator? Uh, you can watch Elevator on Hulu goes all the way up to the current season season two and i think only the first season is on netflix but you can so you can watch them on both mm-hmm. and they're they're in about an hour long and it's i mean i like game shows where like people can win stuff and they're winning money in this mm-hmm. and that's nice it's got the horror theme which is kind of fun and the um the hosts the sisters are sort of they're they're antagonistic in a way they're in like another room they're in like a control room and mm. taunting the people and making fun of them and in, in 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 ways that are that are sort of fun uh but it's sort of different than the usual host dynamic where the host is is uh is encouraging or something like that um so it's just it's it, it was sort of a fun thing that we uh watched through uh last week um uh yeah hell of a cool year. cool Sounds good. Cool. Did you guys hear about that awful, that fucked up, like, reality game show in Russia where they, like, let people in the woods and they're basically, like, there are no rules. I mean, if it's illegal, everything's being filmed. So, I I mean, I think this is part of the promotional gimmick, but they specifically are, like, we're not going to step in and prevent specifically rape and murder from happening. But everything's on film. So, you know, if you do something criminal, the police are going to come get you. That's crazy. It's just the whole thing. I'm like, oh, like, just fuck What's you. What's going on in Russia? What's going on in the whole world, man? Like, it's, I've heard of other, like, game shows that weren't quite that extreme. But I remember hearing about one in Japan. There was, like, a This American Life about it where, mm. I think it was Japan, where the guy, like, was, like, isolated in a house for, like, a year or something. And I'd, like, do challenges to get any kind of human contact. And he really, like, unraveled. Like, it, like, destroyed, like... He was not okay, and this was national entertainment. And that's, like, that's not okay. Which I don't think that's the same as, like, I'm willing to take a risk. I know I'm signing up for, like, this haunted, this extreme haunted house thing. Yeah, which only lasts in, like, an hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, if you... I wouldn't sign up for that if there was money in it. Yeah, if you... It's, like, $50,000, potentially. (gasps) And just as long as it's genuinely informed consent. Like, you know what you're signing up for. Yeah. Like, I know you don't know what they're going to do to no, you exactly, but, but they, you know the parameters. Yeah. But, like, yeah, let's go do Survivor out in the woods and maybe you get raped or murdered and, like, you know, watch out because the cops will get you. But the show being, like, you have to sign a waiver, basically, that you can't sue the show. 
like anything that happens to you. And I think my guess is they're spinning it for PR purposes. Yeah. And that it's actually not as dissimilar from other awful immoral shows Mm -hmm. as they're trying to spin it as. But the fact that they're even spinning that for PR is like so horrific to me. Like, watch this. You might see someone get raped. Like, why are you doing that? That is not something we need in the world. No. See, and and it's frustrating when they when they they're like, oh, we're gonna come up with all these games. There are some games that they haven't done as like TV shows that we could that would be I think would do very well, like Capture the Flag. Yeah. <laughs> Simple kids games like Capture the Flag. <laughs> like imagine like a paintball survivalist sort of to- sort of twist on Capture the Flag, or an urban Capture the Flag. Yeah. Or a grown up hide and seek. Yeah, yeah that's hide good. Seek. Use GoPros, but maybe it's somewhere weird. That would be an entertaining what? web show too. Like, what just... if he did that in a haunted house? Did hide like and hide and seek in I'm a haunted house? I'm sure that's house. been done. Right? You would think it should have been. There's got to be like a TV version of it though. Like or like Tompkins Square other. Park. Yeah, at night. <laughs> that could be pretty like... much any of the parks at night. <laughs> yeah. Well, so those are the favorite things. Yay! Uh, let's. Uh, just a reminder to anybody listening um, that uh, if you're in the New York area, you can join. Uh, Nicole and I will be teaching a uh, social media and crowdfunding strategies and realities workshop at uh, Videology in Brooklyn on January 28th at uh, 1 o'clock. Um, you can learn more about that workshop uh, at 4 slash workshops. You should um, get tickets in advance. It's going to be really good. When you look it up, you can see what other people have said about our workshops because supposedly they help people. Yeah. So you, yes. you, you could be helped if you... Are look, are, if you're thinking about crowdfunding in 2017 or you just need to like step up your social media presence professionally or personally mm-hmm. for your brand or product or yourself as somebody looking to get hired or whatever it may be. Now, how do you gauge social media presence? Do you kind of do you guys assess that with like the number of following? It's a combination of things. We actually have an audit. That's another service people can get from us that's like more um, mathematical and scientific where we plug in a bunch of different stats from Uh different social media platforms and it actually like spits out like, um, you know, here's where you are in terms of this, here's what we suggest you do, here's where you are in terms of this, like you have like your ratio of people you're following to people following you back is really good. If you wanna up that, here are some suggestions. That's cool. Like there's, but there's a bunch of different metrics that we would use to gauge it. So followers is part of it, but it's also like what kind of engagement you're getting, Uh like how frequently you're posting, like how people are reacting to what you post, like. I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in finding that out. Yeah. 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 Me too. (laughs) I'd be interested in finding that out. (laughs) I Same. should plug my stuff into there. Yeah, um, we like, both should. We should. We actually haven't tested our own personal. Do that, that and then like kind of like sh- make a video or yeah. to do a, uh, an episode about that. We'll be like, look how we learned how we actually kind of suck. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're awesome, <laughs> and that's why people should come to the workshop. <laughs> Edit that out. <laughs> we are. Yeah, so, I have like twelve Twitter accounts, though it depends which one. Some are doing quite well. Some are a little right. maybe neglected, yeah. but. Speaking of accounts, uh, where can people find you online? Um, they can find me. Uh, they can find me on Instagram. My handle is. What's my handle? Isn't it <laughs> Hey Hey on? So I have this hey, hey, weird thing like, where my Twitter one is different. I think your Twitter one is. I signed up too late for. Oh, so on Instagram, I'm at Hey Hey on. So H E Y H Y E Y U N. And on Twitter, those two are switched. Um, mm. But don't worry about that. Just, uh, I'm on Instagram and um, on Facebook. Uh, you can check out uh, both seasons of my web series, Hey On, at heyheyon.com. And, um, and yeah, uh, we're going to figure out when um, my new show, BKPI, is coming out with um, the producing uh, company, Super Deluxe. So stay tuned for that. I imagine early next year Sweet. we'll launch it. And yeah. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. And we're Four Mile Circus. That's fourmilecircus.com. Twitter, Four Mile Circus. Facebook, Four Mile Circus. Instagram, Four Mile Circus. And we'll be back in the next episode with a little bit more with uh, Hey Ian Park, where we'll be talking about uh, uh, funding and her projects. Goodbye. If you like what you heard, please subscribe on iTunes 
or your podcast platform of choice and check out other 4 Mile Circus services and projects at 4milecircus.com as well as 4 Mile Circus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Watch our first VOD release, Nicole's award-winning feminist phone sex horror comedy, Small Talk, at 4milecircus.com store 